Uh, welcome along to a little video on um, black body radiation. Um, black body radiation turns out to be really important in astrophysics and perhaps um, we should explain why. So to start with, we're just going to think about um, a silver shiny ball and a black ball and we're going to kind of put them under the grill at home and then there'll be lots of infrared radiation shining on them. And you're probably thinking, oh, what he's going to tell us is, of course, the black ball is much better at absorbing radiation. And that's true. But the weird thing is, say this heats up to 300 kelvins. Um, when it gets to 300 kelvins and stops getting hotter, of course, it must reach an equilibrium temperature. If it's no longer getting hotter, it must be giving out radiation as fast as it's absorbing radiation. So as well as being really good at absorbing radiation, it must be equally good at emitting radiation. So it turns out that black bodies are good absorbers of radiation as well as good emitters of radiation. And that's why things like the sun can be considered a perfect black body, but obviously also fairly famously really shiny. A black body is something that absorbs all the radiation that falls on it. And any photon that goes into the sun will immediately meet an electron, transfer its energy to that electron and be absorbed. So at that moment, the, the energy has gone. It's a perfect black body. All our experiments on Earth are done with basically a kiln, a, a fancy word for a hot oven, which has got a hole in it and it's black inside. If any photons or radiation were to go in there, it would be quite strongly absorbed in each reflection, and there's really no chance of that photon ever bouncing back out of that hole before it's absorbed, so that's a perfect black body. We then analyse the radiation that comes out of the hole into what's called a set of um, radiation curves. Let's just sketch those up here. So our axes, uh, the wavelength of the emitted radiation and the power, amount of power. You might see a posh word here like emissivity. Um, but it just means how much energy is coming out per second at each wavelength. And we get this characteristic curve. So it's steeper on the left than the right. There is a kind of modestly defined peak. And let's imagine that our furnace is set to 300 Kelvin and we'd see a curve like that. If we set it to a higher temperature, like 400 kelvins, our peak would be higher, but also our peak would be further to the left. So that might be our 400 kelvin, and then we might go even higher. A lot more power output as we go up in temperature, we'll come to that later. Um, but each time, the peak moving to the left. And it turns out, in fact, I haven't done the peak to the left very well there. It turns out that the Temperature is inversely proportional to the peak wavelength, and that's something that's called Wine's Law. Okay, um, Wine's Law here is here in the astrophysics section. Lambda max T equals 2.9 times 10 to the minus 3, and that's not millikelvins, that's meter kelvins. Kelvins for temperature, so temperature has to be in kelvins, and M is for um, the meters for the wavelength. So lambda max. T is equal to um, 2.9 times 10 to the minus 3 mk. And we're now going to apply that um, equation to work out roughly how hot the, the outside the surface of the sun is. Because we can find lambda max for the sun by analysing the spectrum, and we get uh, about 500 nanometers. So we can substitute that into that equation and then we should get a temperature. So my suggestion is you pause the video and you now actually do that calculation. Um, so pause now. Okay, I'm assuming you've unpaused, you've got an answer, and you're just going to see if I'm smart enough to get the right answer, because I haven't practiced this as ever. So the um, temperature is equal to 2.9 times 10 to the minus 3 over lambda max, which is 500 times 10 to the minus 9, 
fraction battle on the calculator, 2.9x minus 3. Bottom, 500x minus 9. Prick 8 equals, and we get the temperature of the sun, I'm sure you got it as well, is 5,800 kelvins. And as I understand it, that's a really, a, a pretty good answer. Um, and that's really important because that means for any star where we can take a spectrum, we can find the peak wavelength, we know the temperature. It might explain how we know that there are hotter stars and cooler stars. More of that in another video. The other thing that happens as the temperature goes up, you can see the power output goes up. And that leads to something called Stefan's Law. Stefan's Law, next week, probably saw it. Power equals sigma A, T to the 4. Um, quite hard to draw a sigma a t to the 4. One of the differences um, with this equation is that um, we will need to um, actually look up the constant from the front. So we've got to look up Stefan's constant. We're looking for that sigma. There it is, 5.67 times 10 to the minus 8 watts per metre square Kelvin to the minus 4. So... Stefan's constant, 5.67 times 10 to the minus 8. Um, what we're going to have a go at in a moment is finding the power output of the sun. And from the power output of the sun, we can find the surface area of the sun, and then we can find the radius of the sun. We'll need um, one additional piece of information um, to do that, and that is... We need to know how much power is coming from the sun um, per metre squared on planet Earth. And I'm going to send you a link so you can see um, Brian Cox um, being paid a fortune to stand in the desert with an umbrella. Um, but it does make quite a good point about um, how we would know how much energy is arriving at the surface of the Earth. So, how are we going to go about doing this? Um, I'll put that to the side because I might need some information from it. So here's the sun. Here's the earth. And you know that that distance is one astronomical unit, which I'll tell you is 1.5 times 10 to the 11 metres. And we're going to imagine planet earth is sat on this giant sphere of that radius. And what Brian Cox will tell us is that the insulation rate, the, the rate at which energy arrives from the sun, is about a thousand watts per meter squared. So our first question is, what is the power output of the sun. Um, if you want to do, if you feel you're feeling confident, you can do that without any tips and you can pause now. Most of you will probably want this tip. Well, what we're saying is each one little metre squared of that enormous sphere, sphere got a thousand watts. If we knew the area of that sphere, that surface area of that sphere, which is 4 pi r squared, then we would know each one of the one metre squared in that area was receiving a thousand watts. So we do the area minus a thousand area times a thousand, and it should give the, as the power output of the sun. So I pause the video now and work that out. Right, great. So you've unpaused. So we're going to find the surface area of this imaginary sphere. It's uh, four pi, one point five times ten to the eleven squared, grab the old calculator, 4 times shift pi times 1.5x11 squared equals um, 2.82 times 10 to the 23. That's actually quite poor form in terms of significant figures. I think just 2.8 will do. Times that by a thousand, because each square meter gets a thousand watts, and we get a power output of the sun of 2.8 times 10 to the 26 watts, which is really quite close to the 
the accepted value. The next thing we can do, if we remember Stefan's law, P equals sigma A T to the four. We're just going to pause and have a couple of think, couple of think about a couple of um, things in Stefan's law. One thing is that this area is now the thing area, not of that entire sphere, but the air, surface area of the sun, the, the, the actual part of the sun that's giving out radiation. And look at this T to the four term. So if you can imagine, if we doubled the temperature of an object, so we compared a star at 3,000 kelvins and 6,000 kelvins, that's two times two times two times two, two to the four times brighter, two, four, eight, 16 times brighter if you double the temperature, which is, we'll, we'll see the effect of that later. So we know the power output of the sun is 2.8 times 10 to the 26 watts. You know the temperature of the surface of the sun, we just worked that out, it was 5,800 kelvins. So you should now be able to work out the surface area and then the radius of the sun. So if you pause the video now um, and have a go at that calculation. Right, I'm assuming you're unpausing now. So the surface area of the sun is going to be equal to the power output over sigma t to the 4. Um, one of the reasons we won't get a, a, a particularly precise answer, it won't be too bad, is because when you do t to the 4, any small error is magnified. So if it was a 2% error, four times more, it would become an 8% error, wouldn't it? So we get 2.8 times 10 to the 26 over Stefan's constant, constant, which I believe I wrote down. I wrote that down over here, didn't I? 5.67 times 10 to the minus 8 times 5,800 to the power 4. Stick that on our calculators. Um, 2.8x26 over 5.67x minus 8 times 5800 to the power 4 equals. So the surface area of the sun is um, 4.36 times 10 to the 18. Uh, I'm just thinking ahead to see whether that looks like it could be anything like plausible. I think it is. And that's obviously equal to 4 pi r squared is 4.36. Um, times 10 to the 18. So R will be the square root of our previous answer. I probably should write the whole number in, but I'm re realising the video is getting a bit long. Um, divided by 4 pi. Okay, so I'll do square root fraction answer 4 times shift pi. equals eng 5.89 times 10 to the 8 meters, which actually I think is a pretty good answer. The correct answer is 6.96 times 10 to the 8, but there will be a magnifying error from our approximate peak wavelength. Hope you found that useful. Do complete the other work we've sent along with this. Thank you very much. Bye.